secret of laughter lies in the laughing, not in the search for joy. It's a swallow winging on the wind, it's in a sense and a boy. And you'll never sing You could win the world And still be poor Win peace and live like a king When your road seems strange In a tempest seize the lightning flash And ride the winds of change Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to Sunday service on this beautiful, very beautiful, rainy day. Um, we want to welcome all of those of you who are new to Ananda and also those joining us on the internet. My name is Naya Swami Anandi. This is Tiagi Peter. It's our joy to be with you today. <clears throat> I'm going to begin with a reading from Rays of the One Light, which are weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita, written by Swami Kriyananda. This week's reading, week number three, is God present even there where there is ignorance? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, makes a reference to the divine light that is obscure to the rational faculty, but that enlightens our higher nature. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Reason recoils from this statement with innumerable questions. What is this darkness? Is it conscious that it should comprehend anything? What sort of light would be capable of shining in darkness without transforming at least that part of the darkness in which it shines into light? Does this light shine only at night? And if so, why only then? The solution is that to divine sight even daylight seems darkness. The sun itself, like the moon, which shines only by reflected light from the sun, is but a kind of reflection of the cosmic light, which, being immaterial, is invisible to the eyes, 
but which is the great source of all material reality. In Autobiography of a Yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda describes his youthful visit to Ram Gopal Musamdar, the sleepless saint, who lived in the vision of that hidden light. Around midnight, Yogananda wrote, Ram Gopal fell into silence, and I lay down on my blankets. Closing my eyes, I saw flashes of lightning. The vast space within me was a chamber of molten light. I opened my eyes and observed the same dazzling radiance. The room became a part of the infinite vault which I beheld with interior vision. Why don't you go to sleep? Sir, how can I sleep in the presence of lightning, blazing whether my eyes are shut or open? You are blessed to have this experience. The spiritual radiations are not easily seen. The saint added a few words of affection. This is the light that shineth in darkness. It has been described variously in the great scriptures. In the Bhagavad Gita, the 11th chapter, the devotee, Arjuna, is given an experience of the infinite state and exclaims in awe. If there should rise suddenly within the skies sunburst of a thousand suns, flooding earth with beams undeemed of, then might be that holy one's majesty and radiance dreamed of. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, om, om. First is a reading from Yogananda's book, Whispers from Eternity. This is his book of mystical poetry. O oh, divine friend, though the darkness of my ignorance be as old as the world, still make me realize that with the dawn of thy light, the darkness will vanish as though it had never been. I remember when I was in college and studying to be a chemist, I was in chemistry, that we spent a lot of time talking about materials and matter at an atomic level. And we actually worked with um, different kinds of apparatus where you could create an excellent volu uh, volume of space that would be nearly free of any kind of particles or um, matter or gas. And we'd actually use that to do experiments with. And so I had this kind of fixed idea that when you had an, a space that was essentially a vacuum, it meant there was really nothing left in it. It was just truly empty space. All the air molecules were gone. Everything was gone. It was just empty space. There was really nothing there. And then I did my first course in particle physics, which is about the physics of the very small, about subquantum particles and quantum particles. They're usually at the level of atoms and smaller. And one of the remarkable things that came out of our understanding of matter and space at this very microscopic level so small you can't see things with a microscope. You can often measure the effects of what's happening, but it's very difficult to see these particles directly. One of the things that they found was that, and this was just uh, over a, about 100 years ago, 
that this was discovered, that in fact this thing we called empty space was in fact boiling with energy, and that there were different kinds of particles, subatomic particles, that were constantly winking out it, winking in and out of existence. They'd materialize, be there for an incredibly short period of time, and dematerialize and sink back into the sea of energy. And it was just the nature of space that this would happen. In fact, it was kind of interesting. One of the um, points our instructor made was he said, "You know, there's this very odd part of physics that sometimes we talk about. We talk about. It's called zero point energy." And it gets at the fact that even if you have a totally empty space that's completely a vacuum, there's nothing in there that you can see. There's no radiation coming from the outside. Let's say we encase it in lead, so no energy from outside can get in. The box is, in fact, still full of energy, with these particles winking in, in and out of existence. And he actually posited the thought: Wouldn't it be remarkable if there was some way we could ever figure out to tap that energy and use it? <clears throat> Still highly controversial, by the way. But I remember that was kind of my first introduction that empty space really wasn't empty space; that there, in fact, was something there, and this idea that um, things were all structured and material. Was really just a construction in our minds, and certainly had me much better prepared for the fact that not only is space filled with energy and these particles winking in and out of existence, but it's filled with consciousness that underlies it, and in fact, every every centimeter, every Volume of space is filled with God's consciousness and God's light. <clears throat> to be able to see that light, to be able to comprehend that light, to know that light, is really the process that we go through as devotees. On our path, we use the technique Kriya Yoga, which has been designed. To help us know this light, to know this consciousness, and give us a direct, real experience of it. Well, what can that experience be like? Well,、um, it can be while you're meditating deeply, suddenly seeing a bright light, even much brighter than it would feel looking directly at the sun, except it's not uncomfortable. And seeing that here at the point between the eyebrows, or you might see what the yogis call the spiritual eye, which is a gold ring with a cobalt field in the center and a small star in the center of that.、Um, and that spiritual eye, this ring, actually begins to have a three-dimensional feel, where it's not just a flat thing you're seeing, but you realize it has tremendous depth. And the deeper you meditate, the further you penetrate into this space, until you feel yourself expanding into this space. It's possible that you would hear the Om sound, which at first can be very quiet, but as you meditate more deeply, will actually become so loud it feels like it's echoing and booming within your body, within your mind. Or you can feel this as a tremendous expansion in your heart. Feel it as gratitude. Feel it as love for every particle of creation, for every participant in this world of ours in this universe, and a tremendous feeling of love for God. I was thinking last night as I was meditating, getting ready for、uh, service today. Um, and I was feeling my my heart expanding with my kriya practice, and just feeling that sense of gratitude. I thought to myself, what other times have I felt this in my life? Because this is very familiar. And I thought back to soon after I first took kriya, I began feeling this same energy, this love, 
gratitude, expansive energy in my heart. Sometimes it would feel as though my, the area here and the area in my heart would just collapse down into a single point and would just, everything would expand from there. And it was incredibly relishable when I would feel that. And this was after just taking Kriya and doing it for some months, I began feeling this. <clears throat> I realized I'd actually had an experience of that years before. And it's a very, it's kind of a curious story. I was 17 years old and uh, took Korea when I was about 28 or 29, so this was a good 10, 11 years before. I was a senior in high school, and uh, it was kind of a very curious thing. One of the things I was doing that year was uh, playing on our football team, which had been uh, very successful that year. In fact, we not only won our league, but we qualified for the championships which were going to be played against teams all over California and was going to be played for the, the state championship in football. And quite honestly, um, none of us as football players were that good. I mean, we were all kind of B-plus players, and we had one or two guys that were a little bit better, but we didn't have any really terrific standouts or a fabulous quarterback or a fabulous running back. They were all just good. The one thing we had, though, was we had a coach who really knew how to work with us, and his whole thing was attitude, discipline, and repetition of fundamentals. I mean, it was just perfect for someone who'd been a yogi in a previous lifetime. <laughs> <clears throat> exactly the right way to work, for, work with us. And uh, he was, uh, for those of you who've read Autobiography of Yogi, and um, read what Yogananda said about his guru, Sri Yukteswar. He was a very Sri Yukteswar type teacher. Um, and I remember the first time he actually smiled and said something uh, complimentary to me, I almost fell over because it had been like a whole year of nothing but, Van Houten, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. Why are you, why are you giving up? So, um, we managed to make it through the first playoff game, managed to make it through the second playoff game, and I'd have to tell you when we got into the third round of playoffs, we're down to basically four teams in California, the top four teams in California. Um, we went into the game and the uh, uh, lineman who was next to me, I was one of the linemen, was the biggest fellow on our team. And we both lined up and our opponents lined up across from us, the guys that we were gonna be sort of battling all night. And they were so much bigger than we were. It was astounding. They were both, I, I looked over at my friend and he looked at me and as big as he was, he looked at me and his eyes were just huge. In fact, I had this thought, it was almost like two little boys going out to play football with their dad when we looked at the guys across from us. <clears throat> well, somehow we, we barely squeaked out a victory. We were a very much a fourth, what they call a fourth quarter team. That right toward the end, often we would be the fittest, the strongest, the best attitude. We kind of hang in there and we actually won against this really huge, terrific team. And uh, I remember that night I went home and I was sitting in the bathtub kind of recovering and I heard from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, there was not a part of my body that I didn't feel had been, uh, not been beaten up. I felt like somebody had attacked me with a two by four. <clears throat> and I remember having this thought is, how are we gonna do this next week? Because every week has gotten worse. These, and every team is tougher. And I barely hung in there tonight. In fact, I know all my team members did. <clears throat> so during that week, I actually started praying about it because I was actually kind of worried how all this was gonna go. And uh, probably, you know, I always pray when my family went to church, but outside of that, it would not, wouldn't occur to me to really ask for anything. But this was probably one of my first times where I was kind of praying with a little bit of desperation because I knew what we were headed into. This was for the championship of all of California. A lot of people were counting on me. 
And I was uh, driving down one of the streets and I often would pray when I would be driving somewhere. And suddenly I felt this huge expansion in my heart and this tremendous sense of gratitude and kind of well-being, like I didn't really need to worry. In fact, my first response was to just stop where I, going where I was headed and just go to the church where I attended. And I'd never gone there during the week. And I went in and just sat down and prayed for about an hour. And finally, um, the minister came out and asked if he could help me because no one ever came in and sat in the Protestant <laughs> church in the middle of the day. <laughs> and um, I, didn't ha I, I couldn't even describe what I was feeling. And so I just sort of thanked him and left. But that feeling stayed with me for days. And I just knew we were going to win this championship game after that. And I really didn't worry. Here's the thing that was very interesting to me, is that when we went to play, it was a very hard game, but I actually felt like I played pretty well that night. Um, you know, I probably did as well as I could hope to do. So, you know, the game ended, we won it. In fact, we trounced the other team, quite amazingly to me. Um, and so we won the championship for the state of California. Well, that following Monday, uh, we would always have this routine where we would sit down and we would watch the films of the game we had just played and the coaches would critique everything. And it was always a little bit of a bloodbath because everybody got criticized. And it was kind of fun this once because there wasn't anything to criticize us. We were all done. There was nothing less for, left for us to learn. So it was a little bit more, they were just, they would kind of point out when somebody did something particularly good. And I have to tell you, I played in a, a, just a shockingly good game. In fact, what I would have to say is that if I thought about the best I could possibly play, this was so much better than that, it was almost like it was superhuman. In fact, a couple of times, something I'd never seen our coach do, he, got, he stopped the film, he went up and tapped on the screen, pointing to me and said, look at Van, look at Van. Well, they called me Van then, or Van Houten. <laughs> look, how, look what he's doing. And at another point, he hopped up, did the same thing again. He said, look at Van, I'm going to play this again and watch what happens, because somehow I had overpowered, the, overpowered this fellow who was much larger than me, ended up kind of creating this opening where we could score a touchdown. And he looked over at me, and he, he just, and it, one of the few times he'd ever called me by my first name, he said, perfect, Peter. That's just perfect, with a little amazement on his face. It was like, <laughs> and I must admit, I was amazed. It was so much better than I really deserved to play. <clears throat> you know, it's curious, because I remember that feeling that I had in my heart, and if I had to say right now, what do I remember more strongly? That sensation I was describing to you of gratitude, of expansive love, of just a feeling of there is nothing to fear in this world that I experienced as a 17-year-old. That was 48 years ago. Do I remember that better or do I remember what I did yesterday? Yesterday I was studying for some medical education materials all day. Just yesterday, I can kind of tell you everything I did. But in terms of how well I remember it, I remember that thing when I was age 17. And I, that feeling is so reminiscent of exactly what we feel when we meditate deeply during Kriya. Yogananda talked about Saint Anthony, often he's called Saint Anthony of the Desert or Anthony the Great. He was one of the first of the desert fa fathers. He lived in about uh, 250 to 300 uh, AD. And he's actually been called the, the father of monasticism. And he, he would go off and live in very secluded places for long periods of time where people would sort of bring and leave food for him and he would be completely in solitude. And at one point he went, and this was in the desert in Egypt, and he sealed himself up in, sealed himself up in a, a tomb. So he was in the dark with 
very little food. He would only open the tomb to come out and get food occasionally, and so a little bit of water. In fact, the uh, first time I ever heard Yogananda's voice was on a recording where he talked about this experience that St. Anthony had. And uh, it's as though, you know, it's so funny, even though this was 35 years ago, I can still hear Master's words in my mind. It was so charming to hear his Bengali accent. Um, but also the spiritual power that was behind him where he talked about the experience that St. Anthony had. Um, where St. Anthony is here in this tomb and uh, is in darkness with very little to eat, and he's being tormented by horrific visions and all sorts of wild temptations. And really, they're inex inescapable. And really, all he can do is continue to pray um, for God's assistance, for God's help. And finally, Satan himself begins to collapse the tomb he's in and, is th and threatens to destroy him. <coughs> and Anthony continues praying and suddenly there's this brilliant flash of light and all these horrific visions leave and suddenly he feels God's presence. God is there with him. And he prays and says, God, where were you before? I have passed in such great agony. And God says to him, Anthony, I was just the same with you. That is to say, I've been here the whole time. I've been assisting you the whole time. It's just you couldn't see me. You couldn't feel me. But I was here. You know, I think for all of us, there's a lesson in that, that uh, if we're actually trying to make progress on the spiritual path, we're going to have tumultuous things happen in our lives. I, I don't think there's such a thing as a boring life for a yogi because we've signed on to basically have, uh, how did Yogananda put it? He said, uh, every cavity in my spiritual den dental jaw was... <laughs> was pulled out by Yukteswar, every diseased tooth, um, that we're really signing on for even our most tender spots to be rectified, to be worked with in a way that could be actually very painful when we go through it, but the outcome is that we're freer afterwards. <clears throat> About four months ago, I was approached by um, one of the judges in the legal system here in uh, Nevada County uh, asking for some help for some work that they were trying to do in reorganizing the legal system here in Nevada County. They'd sort of realized that uh, all the laws they were working with that dealt with mental illness, people who had substance use problems, were all very outdated and the attitudes were very outdated. Uh, in fact, they realized they'd been warehousing, essentially just putting people in jail, that really would be better served by having some sort of rehabilitation and be assisted that way. And they were trying to sort of make sense of it and sort of how do we figure out who we could help with therapy, maybe medication, help with staying off their substances could actually be rehabilitated and who really is the only option is to put them in a setting where they can't hurt others. And it was going to be a major shift for how they worked as a total county. So what they asked me to do since our medical practice, what we've been working on for the last um, 30 years we've been in existence is how do you integrate the fact that people have mental health needs, um, their own attitudes that we need to assist them with. And frankly, we use a style that is very reminiscent of the way Yogananda would work with us as yogis. 
um, very much the kinds of things we teach here at the Expanding Light are precisely the kind of things that we use in our practices around right attitude, um, simple meditation techniques. And we do that with a population that's about 60% uh, impoverished. And we use all the same things with them. And it's surprising how helpful it is and how much of that they'll actually take up and use. And people always feel very well cared for. They can feel the fact that we've wrapped our energy around them in assistance. And it lets them relax a little bit. They're not having to fight with a system. They're being aided by a system. And we actually can help them make positive change. Well, the local judges had heard that we'd had a lot of success in what we were doing and how we worked with people. So he sort of asked me if I could put together a course that would be um, a couple hours long that we could present to all the judges where to kind of talk about how we work with human beings, how we work with people in a kind, compassionate way that takes into account they have behavioral health needs, they have medical needs, and they may have substance use problems. And how could we tailor this for the justice system? And uh, so we scheduled this. And uh, every week or so, the woman who was my liaison with them kept saying, you know, um, more people would like to come to this. So uh, I think it's going to be more than just the judges and the people from the courthouse. You know, they're going to close court for the day, which is very unusual to actually close the courthouse down. Um, so instead of, you know, 20 or 25 people, it looks like it'll be about 40. Well, after another week had gone by, we broke the 100 mark because all the surrounding counties wanted to send their judges and their, um, their staffs. And she came back a couple weeks later and said, well, now all the attorneys locally would like to come because they would like to hear what you would suggest and how we work with this. And she came back two weeks later and said, well, now it's over 200. And I finally found one place where we can get 250 people in. Um, so even if a few extra people come, I think we can get everybody in. But everybody from the fire district, um, all the county offices are coming. They would really like to hear what you have to say about how do we deal with this fact that people have mental health uh, requirements, uh, and even someone who's normally pretty healthy may not be at their best when they're dealing with the legal system or the county. <clears throat> <clears throat> so when I showed up, it was close to 300 people packed into this room, and it was interesting because, you know, I knew most of the police officers and sheriffs, uh, if not by, um, not in person, at least I recognized their names, plus all the county offices and the local judges. And I don't think any of you who've taken my uh, brain classes or some of the courses I've taught here at the Expanding Light would be very surprised by the kind of material that I covered. It was very much sort of that material tailored for a, a justice situation and sort of how do you take account of people's neurobiology attitudes and positive aspirations in this very harsh environment of the justice system. <clears throat> and I was about a half an hour into my talk and I looked up and, you know, I actually felt a few days before I was going to give this talk, I could feel this is really important. These people really want me to come do this. You know, this may be one of the reasons I incarnated. That's how important it felt. Um, so about half an hour into this talk, um, I looked up and the room was just completely silent. No one was moving. And I'd sort of left it, people could ask questions, and I was sort of expecting to have people interrupt me with questions, but it was just totally silent. People were, it was as attentive as I have ever had a group to speak to. And I looked up again at the one hour mark, and it was absolutely the same. People just had all their attention, and they were really listening and trying to understand, because I, 
what I realized was this tremendous power was coming through me and it was bringing with it answers that they really needed and they were really hungry for because what they were doing was not working. And by the end, when we, you know, wrapped up at, you know, an hour and 45 minutes, two hours, um, it was very interesting. Initially, no one even came up to talk to me afterwards. You know, it was almost like, uh, you know, <laughs> who was this person? Who was that masked man? <laughs> um, and, you know, it's very interesting to me, but the feedback I've gotten on that talk is probably as good as I've ever gotten on anything I've ever done. In fact, one of the judges took my outline, the PowerPoint that I uh, prepared, and broke it down into 10 sections as study modules. And each week, all the different areas within the county use one section as a study module for that week. And that entire week, they try to take the lesson from that section, and it might be something as simple as when you interact with other people, having a positive attitude yourself and greeting people with positive energy and a smile automatically makes them want to smile and give you positive energy back. Much better than being sort of the gruff civil servant, it's much, much better to be positive, welcoming, and in fact, you'll get a better response from the, the clients. <clears throat> and so here with just a very small thing that I was involved in, it's really, and I've gotten this as feedback from the people in the justice system, but they really feel that this was kind of the critical tipping point for them where they were ready to change course. And it was the moment, kind of the astral hour when this was supposed to happen. And now they're headed in this different direction. And uh, it's so funny, I've gotten very few questions afterwards. It was like, whatever they needed came through right at that moment. And uh, I've had a few clarifications and a few kind of advanced questions, but much less than I would have expected. And I think that somehow God had engineered it so that exactly what they needed popped through. <clears throat> you know, recently the Korea ministers um, met with Jyotish and Devi, and we were talking about the future of Kriya Yoga, Kriya Yoga uh, training uh, for people in our work and the importance of Kriya Yoga. And one comment that Jyotish made to all of us was, you know, at every talk we give, no matter what the topic, we should always talk a little bit about Kriya Yoga and its importance. Because there, are so, there, are, there is so much in Yogananda's teachings that it would be very easy to just stay on different topics and never bring it back to this focus of our central technique of Kriya, where what Yogananda brought to the West with this concept that here is this God-given technique of Kriya that when coupled with ardent devotion will give you God realization. And it's, he makes it as a promise, as a guarantee that that will happen. And I think the thought that I had in preparing for today was that, you know, we have one of our annual Kriya Yoga weekends coming up in May. I think it's toward the end of May that this is happening. And I think for all of you who have Kriya Yoga, this would be a really good time to start in training, getting ready for that weekend. And ask yourself, are there any of the advanced techniques that I have not taken that would be a good addition to what I'm doing already? Maybe you've been happy with just the primary Kriya, the first Kriya, and you've been doing that for some years, but you've never taken the second Kriya, third Kriya, fourth Kriya, or um, any of the other more advanced techniques like Kachari Mudra. This would be a very good time to sort of start getting yourself ready because that weekend is coming and it would be a perfect time to take a, a next step with your Kriya Yoga practice. And, you know, even if you don't feel like there's an additional technique you need, maybe just to see yourself in training that I want to go into that weekend with my Kriya Yoga practice at its top, 
so that I can get the most out of that whole experience of being together with many other Kriya bonds and participating in uh, ceremonies and talks that all have to do with, uh, with God and enlightenment and how we achieve that through Kriya. You know, for those of you where this might be your very first Sunday service, or maybe you're someone who's just learned one of our uh, meditation techniques, maybe the energization exercises, maybe you've learned Hong Sa. I think the thing I would say to you is, time's a, time is a wasting. Remember that even if you're brand new to something like this, if you really wanna find out if this is for you, the best way to do that is to dive deep in it pretty quickly and start doing the practices and see if this is the right path for you. In fact, I can tell you that if this is not the right place for you, you'll know that very quickly. It will happen, and it will happen faster if you actually apply yourself. The more you apply yourself, the more you really try to go deep in Yogananda's techniques and teachings, what you find is if it's not exactly right, God will kind of start pushing you in the right direction, um, the direction that you were ultimately to end up in. Um, but if this is your home, you might as well get started now. If you're someone who has never taken Korea, um, maybe just read about it, maybe just heard about it, but you're doing one of the other techniques, start thinking about maybe I'll take Korea in May when I have this opportunity. Because that was one of the key teachings that Yogananda brought to the West. I think as, um, as Swami often told us, Yogananda came to bring the concept of subtle energy and joyful magnetism. But he also brought with him the teachings of Kriya. And for all of us who are disciples of Yogananda and are following his teachings and practitioners of Kriya, we are Kriya bonds. I've often thought, you know, what should I write down on one of those little forms when they ask what religion I am? I wouldn't write Hindu, just it's self-realization. Um, Sanat and Dharma, and I was actually thinking last night, I think probably what I'd write is Kriyaban. I'm a Kriya yogi, that is my religion, because my guru has promised me that with the application of my ardor, my devotion, and the practice of Kriya yoga, I will find God. The green Destroy. I crave.